Hey there! Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Freedom is all about choices. And while there is only one Jeep brand, you have the freedom to choose from an epic lineup of Jeep brand vehicles. Hit the trails with a versatile classic, the Jeep Gladiator, or experience the wild in style with the sophistication and comfort of the Jeep Grand Cherokee or Jeep Grand Cherokee 4xE. Looking for a more immersive experience? Let nature come to you in the open-air Jeep Wrangler or Jeep Wrangler 4xE, America's best-selling plug-in hybrid. Whatever you choose, adventure is just one drive away. Visit Jeep.com for details. Based on 2022 CYQ4 sales, GD Power retail sales data, Jeep is a registered trademark. Welcome to Pax Britannica. Season 3, Episode 18. Revenge as a Guide. Welcome back to Pax Britannica. I'm your host, Dr. Samuel Hume. Before we begin, I'd like to welcome the new members of the House of Lords. The Earl of Skye, Hannes Hurlitz Bachmann, Henry, Earl of Kettering, Henk, Viscount Twerder, Keith, Viscount Brady, the Baron of Blandford St. Mary, John Walters, and Sophie, Baroness Lewis. Like all other patrons, they can now listen to this episode and every other episode ad-free, and the new Earls can listen to the bonus content. Go to patreon.com slash Pax Britannica to find out more. Last week, we saw how the Council of State and the Rump Parliament had discovered that simply telling the Royalist colonies to stop being Royalist wasn't going to work. These rebels to the new regime needed to learn that despite thousands of miles of open ocean, they were not beyond the reach of London. But the Commonwealth also had to teach that lesson to their colonial friends, The authority proclaimed by Parliamentary Act promised parliamentary interference in all of the colonies, even those who had sympathised with Parliament's cause. They were not happy. After the regicide of January 1649, the new Commonwealth needed to give the Navy some TLC. There were Royalist holdouts in the Channel Islands, in the Isle of Man, in Scotland and the Isles, in Ireland and in the colonies. And even if the new model army was an army of saints they still couldn't walk on water. And the seas around England were plagued with pirates and privateers, either commissioned by the Stuarts or simply taking advantage of the chaos, and the new government really needed the revenue from trade. But beyond the territories claimed by the Commonwealth, Europe was horrified by the execution of an anointed king, and the Peace of Westphalia had mostly ended the Thirty Years' War, and freed up many military forces. The exiled House of Stuart was actively courting the services of these newly available armies, and a foreign intervention to throw down the new republic and restore the monarchies of England, Ireland and Scotland was not impossible to imagine. In order to protect the new republic from without and suppress its enemies from within, it needed a navy. You might recall that the Royal Navy, which Charles I had expanded during his personal rule through the hated ship money, had almost immediately switched sides to Parliament once the English Civil War broke out. But since then, a lot had changed. Divisions within the parliamentary cause, between Presbyterians and Independents, between Radicals and Moderates, and supporters and opponents of the regicide, meant that the Navy was no longer the reliable arm of Parliament. The previous year, a squadron of ships had defected to the Royalist camp, and now sailed under the command of Prince Rupert of the Rhine. Since then, the King had been executed, the House of Lords abolished, and a Republic had been declared. Any one of them was a massive change which the sailors of the Navy had not signed up for. So, that's all to say that the Council of State 
was casting a very paranoid eye over its navy. Before the Civil War, the English Navy was administered by two officers, the Lord Admiral and the Navy Board. To summarise, the Admiralty handled everything to do with actually using the ships, and the Navy Board answered to the Admiralty and was meant to ensure that those ships were fit for use. The Navy Board was responsible for building the ships, operating dockyards and supplying Navy stores. The supply of food and drink was contracted out to victuallers, who were paid a set amount per sailor they were meant to feed. And the naval guns were supplied by the same body which supplied the small English army, the Ordnance Board. With the outbreak of the Civil War, Parliament took control over naval administration, which basically meant that they appointed their own Lord Admiral, Warwick, changed the name of the Navy Board to the Navy Commission, added some MPs to these bodies, and brought in more parliamentary oversight through committees. Fast forward to after the army coup in 1648, and then the establishment of the Republic, with the new regime unable to trust the vast majority of naval officers, a purge was carried out. Anyone whose loyalty to the new Republican regime was not absolute was removed from their posts. The only veterans of the Civil War who kept their positions were independents of unimpeachable reputation, and that amounted to about a third of the pre-purge number. Just days after the regicide, Parliament passed a series of acts to reform the Navy. The office of Lord High Admiral was abolished, and its powers transferred to the newly created Council of State, which then created the Admiralty Committee with Henry Vane as its treasurer and leading figure. Another act established the new position of General at Sea, and then this office was then shared between three triumvirate commissioners, Colonel Edward Popham, Colonel Richard Dean, and Colonel Robert Blake. As their ranks might suggest, these were officers from the army, not from the navy. They were also not grandees, and any decisions they made required at least two of them. This was an army takeover of the navy. The men in charge were army men, and they were still subordinate to the army leadership, and their authority was limited. Presbyterians were removed from the Navy Commission and the Ordnance Board, just as they were from the fleet. About two-thirds of the Navy's administrators were removed. Now, these men were not perfect. There were a lot of inefficiencies, and not a small amount of corruption. But by and large, they were competent. The new men who replaced the administrators were chosen for political and religious allegiance, not for their ability. One of the members of the new Admiralty Committee was Robert Coitmore, about whom Colonel Popham once said, It is not unusual for Mr Coitmore to mistake winter for summer. In other words, he was thick as two short planks, but he was loyal to Henry Vane. The Navy administration, just like other parts of the new regime, would become political battlefields in the Commonwealth's early years, but that's for later. The Navy, no longer royal, was now the state's navy. The ships of the state's navy would fly the new flag of the Commonwealth, the cross and harp, representing England and Ireland. The flying of the royal colours was obviously banned, but so was the Union flag, called the disunion flag in the ban. Ship names and symbols that related to monarchy, or were judged to be too Laudian, were renamed or removed, and replaced with something suitably republican and reformed. The state's navy consisted of 39 ships, and this was far more than the navy had at the start of the Civil War, even accounting for the recent defections. But besides raw numbers of vessels, the state's navy was in poor shape. The purges, conducted for political reasons, had stripped the ships of most of their experienced crew. This, of course, impacted the morale of those who remained. Parliament passed laws allowing for the impressment of sailors into the navy, which didn't help with morale, but at least gave the ships some manpower. The financial straits of the new regime extended to the Navy too. The Navy was expensive, and the Council of State warned its new triumvirate that future funding could not be guaranteed. If they didn't take the fight to their enemies soon, they might not get the chance. Financially, the Navy was always a lower priority than the Army. In the first two years of the Commonwealth, the New Republic was really tight on money. 
and this was despite taxes being 18 times higher than they were before the Civil War. In May 1649, £10,000 which had been ring-fenced for funding the Navy was instead siphoned to the Army, partly to head off the Army levellers. And a similar diversion of funds came again in the summer, during the Irish Campaign. But the successes which we'll see today led to the expansion of the fleet, both directly through the capture and impressment of enemy ships, and through more funding from a government impressed by the defeat of its enemies. Naval expenditure steadily climbed year on year, from about £250,000 in 1649 to nearly three times that by the end of 1652. This spending amounted to 41 new ships being built and manned between 1649 and 1651, that was in addition to armed merchant ships, hired or impressed into service, as well as any captured during war. Speaking of the Commonwealth's enemies, we last left Prince Rupert as he escaped the blockade of the Irish port of Kinsale and sailed to Portugal. He'd been bottled up in Kinsale after Oliver Cromwell's Irish campaign meant the arrival in the Irish Sea of the state's navy. The relentless conquest put Rupert on notice that if he didn't leave Ireland, he might not get the chance. On the 17th of October 1649, a strong wind broke up the blockade, and Rupert, seeing which way the wind was blowing in more ways than one, led a small force of seven ships to safety in Iberia. However, Colonel Blake, who had overseen the Kinsale blockade, was not about to give up. Once safely in the Targus estuary, right next to the Portuguese capital of Lisbon, the royalists were welcomed with open arms. King Joao IV, understandably, was horrified by the regicide, and supported the cause of the exiled Stuarts. From the Targus, Rupert's fleet had a very successful few months of raiding and privateering Commonwealth shipping. Trade goods were brought back to Lisbon and sold for profit, and captured ships were impressed into the tiny Royalist fleet. This was great for the Royalist morale, but it soon became a problem for Joao. Rupert was hardly keeping a low profile. He was attacking not just Commonwealth ships, but also the vessels belonging to their trading partners. Then, he was taking his loot back to the Portuguese capital. The Portuguese government could hardly claim they didn't know it was happening when the king could see Rupert's ships from his window, and it became increasingly embarrassing for the Portuguese crown, especially once the Commonwealth arrived. On the 2nd of March, 1650, Colonel Blake set sail from Portsmouth with a force of 16 warships, and eight days later, his fleet arrived off the Portuguese coast. He had been ordered by the Council of State to put an end to the naval threat posed by Rupert. Not only was his activity damaging trade and worsening the Commonwealth's international relationships, but he posed an existential threat to the Republic. Rupert's fleet could, if neglected, support a naval invasion of Britain or Ireland in support of the Stuarts. It had to be captured or destroyed, and Blake was given leeway to disrupt and even attack Portuguese shipping to see it done. The Commonwealth was willing to risk a war with Portugal to get a hold of Rupert. On the diplomatic front, agents of the English Republic continued to apply pressure to Joao, and publicly railed against Rupert as nothing more than a pirate. Portuguese merchants complained that the presence of the royalists threatened their trade, and there were voices in the Portuguese court which pushed strongly for the breach with London to be mended. Rupert countered with a PR campaign, ensuring he was seen in Lisbon, appeared carefree and charming, and built up a positive image which helped protect his fleet. This left Joao in a difficult spot. At first, he refused to expel the Royalists from port, or to allow the state's navy to attack them at anchor. When Blake attempted to do so anyway, the wind suddenly died, and the Portuguese fleet was able to get between the two groups of English. Blake reluctantly backed off, and stationed his fleet in a blockade of Lisbon. Charles Spencer describes how, with diplomacy stalling and military might not yet brought to bear, Blake sent a small force onto land. Here, they waited for Rupert and Maurice to go hunting, and ambushed them. The princes escaped by the skin of their teeth, and Rupert responded in kind. He sent one of his men, disguised as a Portuguese sailor bringing supplies, 
to plant a bomb on Blake's ship. The plan might have worked if the Portuguese sailor hadn't sworn in English. That gave the game away, and the bomb was discovered and defused, and the assassin imprisoned, although Rupert would secure his release. Both the Portuguese and the Royalists decided to wait out Blake. He was operating very far from home, and surely could not linger for much longer. But the Commonwealth could be very efficient when it needed to be, and the Council of State wanted Rupert's head. Supply ships sailed from England to Lisbon throughout the summer of 1650, which was a logistical achievement all of its own. Another third of the General at Sea, Colonel Popham, soon arrived with reinforcements. The blockade of Lisbon became tighter, and Blake and Popham's patience with the Portuguese grew shorter. Trade into Lisbon dropped to a trickle, and at one point Blake even attacked a Brazilian convoy bound for Lisbon, seizing the valuable colonial goods and bringing Portugal and the Commonwealth to the brink of war. Now, Joao wanted them gone. He wanted the Royalists gone, and Rupert wanted to be gone. But they couldn't get through the blockade. Twice, Rupert tried to slip away without a fight, once in July, when Blake sailed south to Cardiz with the bulk of his fleet to collect fresh water, and again in September, when thick fog shrouded the Targus estuary. On both occasions, the alarm was raised, and Rupert was forced back to port. Twice, the combined effort of the Royalists, the Portuguese, and even French ships attempted to force Blake to withdraw, but the purpose-built warships were more than a match, and the constant resupply kept the fleet in fighting condition. Rupert finally managed to escape the Targus when, in October, a year after arriving, and more than seven months since the blockade began, Blake had once again sailed south to Cardiz to refit his ships and take on more water. This time, Rupert's attempt to break out was successful. He was free. Joao probably breathed a sigh of relief. Rupert sailed away, quote, with poverty and despair being companions and revenge as a guide. At Planet Fitness, Leap Day means an extra day of energy. And who doesn't love energy? To celebrate, now through February 29th, you can join for 29 cents down, $10 a month, and pay nothing until March 17th. Even better, you'll get free fitness training and equipment for every workout, with most clubs open 24 hours. So take advantage of your extra day and get energized at Planet Fitness. Join for 29 cents down, $10 a month, cancel any time, and pay nothing until March 17th. Deal ends February 29th. See Home Club for details. Madame Tussaud. We all know the name, and many of us have visited one of the wax museums which bear that name, but you may not realise the historical significance of the woman behind the name, or how she and her waxworks defined the genre of true crime. If that has piqued your interest, then give The Art of Crime a listen. The Art of Crime is a history podcast by Gavin Whitehead, a historian of Victorian theatre, all about the unlikely collisions between true crime and the arts. If you enjoy the detail of Pax Britannica, then you'll love The Art of Crime. The latest season of The Art of Crime tells two stories. First, it chronicles Tussaud's career, starting in pre-revolutionary France and ending in Victorian London. Second, it tracks the evolution of the Chamber of Horrors, a showroom in her wax museum that exhibited macabre curiosities, including effigies of notorious criminals. You'll hear how Tussaud won patronage from the French royal family, narrowly escaped the guillotine during the Reign of Terror, and became one of the most celebrated showwomen in Paris and London. This season also covers the most divisive assassin of the French Revolution, the last man to be hung, drawn, and quartered for high treason in England, and the glamorous murderer who attained notoriety as a modern Lady Macbeth. Subscribe to The Art of Crime wherever you get your podcasts. Rupert's fleet might have escaped Lisbon, but it had not escaped Blake. He pursued the Royalists as Rupert attempted to flee into the Mediterranean. In early November, Blake caught up with the bulk of the Royalist squadron near Cartagena, and the state's navy made short work of them. According to Spencer, the Royalist fleet, minus Rupert and Maurice's ships, had delayed a rendezvous at the Balearic Islands in order to capture more shipping. When Blake caught up with them, they fled into Cartagena because they expected the Spanish authorities to protect them. They did not. 
nearly all of the Royalist ships were sunk, captured, or ran aground. At Formentera, Rupert and Maurice waited for a fleet that was now either at the bottom of Cartagena Bay, burning on its shores, or sailing under the Cross and Harp. Still hoping that his fleet would return, but not able to wait any longer, Rupert left orders for any stragglers under a rock. Then, he sailed off on board the Constant Reformation, with his brother Maurice aboard the Swallow. The two brothers sailed further up the coast, and finally found refuge at the French naval port of Toulon. The Royalist naval threat had, for the moment, been destroyed. Blake was recalled to the Commonwealth, his mission fully accomplished. Not only had the threat been neutralised, but the mission had displayed Blake's own capabilities as well as those of the new Commonwealth of England. A century and a half later, no less a figure than Admiral Horatio Nelson would look on Blake with admiration. Neutral powers, especially the Spanish, the Portuguese and the Dutch, might not like the new Republican regime, but they could not ignore it. Nicholas Roger, whose naval histories have been invaluable, links the projection of naval power shown by the Lisbon blockade with the diplomatic recognition of the Commonwealth by Spain. It had shown off not only the fearsome capabilities of the new English ships, but also the logistical ability to support a seven-month blockade half an ocean away from a friendly port. Throughout all of this, the Commonwealth was building up its naval forces. Rupert was not the only privateer preying on English shipping. Many Irish privateers were based out of Dunkirk, and the Republic was in an undeclared naval war with French privateers operating from French ports along the Atlantic seaboard, as well as in the Mediterranean. The Levant Company, now that's a blast from the past, complained to Parliament that over two years, French ships had taken ships with cargo worth £600,000 as they sailed from the Ottoman Empire. The Council of State's response became a feature of English, and then British, naval warfare all the way to the Second World War, and it was a tactic just as effective against French galleys as it was against German submarines. The Convoy. A surcharge of 15% was applied to all customs duties in order to pay for convoy protection, and in February 1651, the first convoy set sail for the Mediterranean. For the first time, the English state declared that it would protect English merchant shipping outside of English waters. The naval might of the new republic was displayed to every port and ship they passed, sailing under the cross and harp. Meanwhile, Robert Blake provided naval support in both the Irish and Scottish wars, ferrying troops and supplies, and keeping the sea lanes open and secure from privateers. That duty led him to the Scilly Isles, a tiny archipelago far off the Cornish coast. These islands were still held by royalists, who used it as, what else, but as a base for privateering. These silly privateers have been attacking English and Dutch shipping, and so the States General of the Netherlands had ordered Admiral Martin Harpertzoon Tromp to lead a force to deal with them. When the Council of State learned of this, they sent word to Blake. If the Dutch conquered the Isles, they might not give them back. And besides that, the Scilly Isles were part of the Commonwealth. This was the right, the responsibility, of the state's navy to deal with. So Blake sailed to the Scilly Isles, and here the two fleets, Dutch and English, met. Admiral Trump demanded reparations from the islanders for the losses to Dutch trade, and when this was denied, he declared war on the Scilly Isles on behalf of the Netherlands. Blake insisted that this was Commonwealth business, so Trump held back while the English fought amongst themselves. Blake conquered the Isles, and Trump sailed away, without technically ending the war he'd just declared. Depending on who you ask, this means that for more than three centuries, the Isles of Scilly and the Netherlands were at war. It is highly disputed. For example, Trump probably didn't have the authority to declare war, and the Netherlands are about to be at war with the rest of England anyway, and the treaty which ends that probably covers the Scilly Isles too. But it's an interesting sideshow, and it might come up in a pub quiz, so you're welcome. 
Before we finish today, this last week marked the fifth anniversary of Pax Britannica. I started this in the first years of my PhD, sitting in an Edinburgh B&B while on a research trip. Here I am, here we are, five years later. I didn't think it would take five years to cover 50, but then again I didn't know how much there was to tell about those 50 years. Thank you to everyone, every listener, old or new, for making this podcast possible. Thank you to my House of Lords, including but not limited to the King's favourite Mike Sanders, the Duke of Newcastle, Jonathan Williams, the Marquess of Coventry, Liam Hunter, and the Earl of Scarborough, Jeff Bella. Go to patreon.com slash Pax Britannica to join their ranks and listen to the podcast without ads. If you know someone who might be interested in learning more about this history, send them to pod.link slash Pax. For other great podcasts on the Airwave Network, such as the Explorers podcast, check out airwavemedia.com. Thank you to Sounds Like an Earful for the interval music in today's episode, to my entire House of Lords, and to you for listening. Freedom is all about choices, and while there is only one Jeep brand, you have the freedom to choose from an epic lineup of Jeep brand vehicles. Hit the trails with a versatile classic, the Jeep Gladiator, or experience the wild in style with the sophistication and comfort of the Jeep Grand Cherokee or Jeep Grand Cherokee 4xe. Looking for a more immersive experience? Let nature come to you in the open-air Jeep Wrangler or Jeep Wrangler 4xe, America's best-selling plug-in hybrid. Whatever you choose, adventure is just one drive away. Visit Jeep.com for details. Based on 2022 CYQ4 sales, GD Power retail sales data, Jeep is a registered trademark. The French Revolution set Europe ablaze. It was an age of enlightenment and progress, but also of tyranny and oppression. It was an age of glory and an age of tragedy. One man stood above it all. This was the Age of Napoleon. I'm Everett Rummage, host of the Age of Napoleon podcast. Join me as I examine the life and times of one of the most fascinating and enigmatic characters in modern history. Look for the Age of Napoleon wherever you find your podcasts.